name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Alleluia! 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 Now, can we do the, the Mexican cheer? It, it goes like this. The priest says, Viva Cristo Rey! And the people say, Viva! Viva! Now, that means, in as Spanish, it means, Long live Christ the King! And then the people say, Yes, long live! So the priest will say, Viva Cristo Rey! And you say, Viva! Are you, you, got, you got to punch the ear with your right hand. Ready? Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Now we say La Virgen for Mother Mary, the Virgin, La Virgen. Viva La Virgen! Viva La Virgen! Viva La Virgen! Alleluia! 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 Do you love Jesus? Yes. Clap in such a way that you show the Holy Trinity how much you love him. Clap, show him with your clap. <laughs> Alleluia! Now, can we do this little exercise? Hello. Uh, I do this a lot, even with kids and with big people. Could everyone now, would you take your beautiful right hand like this in front of you? And would you kiss your right hand and blow the kiss to Jesus? <laughs> Woo, you just covered him with lipstick. <laughs> Let's blow Jesus and Mary a kiss. Are you ready, everyone? Ready? Alleluia! See, God is a lover. Amen? Amen? And I was reading in one of the Divine Will books, you know, Father Robert, isn't he a beautiful priest? And he has a fabulous, by the way, his show is excellent. If you have a chance, you can listen to it on the internet as well. That's what I do. It's an excellent show if you have a chance to listen to it. But I was reading in the revelations that God gave to Luisa Picaretta. You know, they, they've all been approved, by the way. All 36 volumes have a double imprimatur. Just so you know that, the Vatican II gave an imprimatur to all 36 volumes of the Living in the Divine Will. Did you know that? It's been approved twice now, and they're getting the official English translation ready for us. It's, it's approved now in Italian. They're getting it ready for English. But I read this. It just blew my mind. You know how the Holy Spirit works? Because for years, when I was having like a charismatic healing mass, I was moved by God to tell everyone, we would do this together. I'm going to teach it to you now. You ready? This is how we pray to God. You say this to God. I love you. I love you. I love you. Can you say that? I love you. I love you. I love you. That's healing. Amen. But I was reading the divine will about Adam, the first man that God made. And it said that when God made Adam, one of the first things that Adam said on the first day, the prayer of Adam was, I love you, I love you, I love you. I didn't know that. That's the prayer God gave me as a teenager. But when I read the Revelation, that's what Adam said. He saw God as a trinity. And he would say to God every day, I love you, I love you, I love you. Is that beautiful? Do you love God? You see, that's all he wants, beloved. He doesn't want your money or anything else. He wants your love. Amen? That's what it's all about. And this beautiful revelation, 
both of the divine will and, and the flame of love. The flame of love is getting ready for the kingdom of the divine will. That's what it's doing. It's getting ready to burn hearts open to receive the fullness of the will of the beautiful God. Amen. Amen. Now, beloved, I was asked to talk about something very special tonight. About forgiveness. It really does fit, doesn't it? You see, because how can we love and how can we have the flame of love if we hate one another? If I hate my dad or my mom, maybe she's 50 years gone to heaven and I still hate her. Or maybe I hate my, my son or my daughter or my uncle or maybe my grandfather abused me when I was a child and I hate him. How in the world can the flame of love catch on fire in my heart if I hate you? Amen? Amen. And so we have to learn how to forgive. And the old saying is true. Forgiveness is divine. It is a divine gift. It is a power from God. Amen? Amen. God can't forgive without God. I can't do it. take my next breath without God. How can I forgive without Him? And so we need a special a revelation. We need a way to forgive. So I asked the Lord one day, some friends of mine, before I was a priest, I kept getting asked this question. Now as a priest in the confessional all the time, people say, well, Father, I forgave my mother-in-law. But I still hate her. <laughs> if I hear this you know, all the time, I'm sure every every priest hears this. Well, I forgave, I forgave my husband, but I, I hate the dirty rascal. <laughs> and they, they, they say, how do I forgive completely and totally? So I brought it to the Lord in prayer. Because my Bible, my Bible says this. Don't we have the same Bible? <laughs> Here's what my Bible says. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. They hear my voice. Amen. Amen. And if we read the same diary of Mrs. Kindleman, the Lord said to Elizabeth, He said to her, I speak to everyone the way I speak to you, but you're the only one who listens. Did you read that in your diary? Ooh, baby, it's in there. He says, I speak to everyone like you, but you're the only one who's listening. Mama Mia! Uchi Mama! We gotta start listening, amen? In other words, God loves you enough to talk to you. Does that make sense? He loves you enough to talk to you, and He wants to speak to you. And it comes, we hear that voice in a special way, in silence. When we spend time, especially before the Eucharist, because God is there incarnate, especially there in the Eucharist, we hear the voice of God clearly. It takes a little bit of practice, doesn't it? But what I found is this, that if you pray the rosary for any intention, Our Lady said, whatever you ask for the rosary, I will grant to you. Whatever you ask for the rosary, I will grant to you. So when I was a teenage boy, and I didn't have a car, and I asked my dad for a car, and he said, no, Jim, we can't afford us. I said, I gotta get to work. So he said, you gotta work to earn the money to get a car. I said, but I can't get to work without a car. So I prayed my emotion, and I asked car, please find me a car, and the next day, I was offered six different cars. <laughs> it's true. Three of them were free. The rose the rosary can do anything, amen? Listen, I was in the middle of a drought once in Georgia. A huge drought many years ago when I went to visit my sister Connie. And everyone was praying for rain. The cattle, the cows were dying in the fields. In my sister's trailer, there was no water coming out of the faucet. It was pretty bad. 
Oh, the bathroom stunk pretty bad. It was awful. And I went to visit my sister in the middle of this drought, and all the churches were praying for rain. And one pastor really got me. I really enjoyed. He was a Protestant, but he was, I think he was a good one. <laughs> and he was telling his people, they were praying for rain. He said, now we're here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming to pray. But I don't believe any one of you. None of you have faith. None of you have faith. You know why? Not one of you brought an umbrella today. <laughs> no one brought an umbrella. They all came to pray, but no one brought an umbrella. What kind of faith is that? Now listen, this is a true story. I prayed for Georgia. I was talking to my sister's husband, my old brother-in-law. He's a Southern Baptist. And I said, Ray, I said, I've been praying for you, Ray. He's a, he's a backslidden Baptist. I said, Ray, I've been praying for you. And Ray said to me, he said, that's good, Jimmy. That's good, Jimmy, but what we really need is some rain. <laughs> so I said, okay, Ray, I'll pray for rain tonight. He said, good, Jimmy. And he took off. He didn't believe me for a second. That night, when everyone went to sleep in my sister's trailer, I went into the private room, the bathroom. It was the scariest place in the whole universe. It smelled so bad. But the Bible said they go to a private closet, right? And pray. It's the only one I knew in the house. So I went in there and I closed the door and I took out my rosary. And when I touched the ground, I heard thunder came across the sky the moment my knee touched the trailer and it rained all night all night long now forgive me for saying this is not very ecumenical but 10,000 Baptists couldn't get any rain but one teenage Catholic boy with a rosary got rain in one second I'm uh, sorry so you know what I do now? I teach the Baptists how to pray the rosary. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And so the rosary is our weapon par excellence. Amen. That's why John Paul said it's my favorite prayer. If you need to hear the voice of the shepherd, ask mama. Ask her from your heart. And here's the other thing. Pray the rosary always. But pray from the bottom of your heart. Don't pray with your lips and don't pray with your head. The Bible says, rend your heart. That means tear it open. It means cut it open. Rend your heart and not your garments. Amen. So when we pray, you pray through the Virgin Mother. Isn't she beautiful? Pray through Mary and pray from the bottom of your heart. Amen. Amen. That's the secret. Amen. Amen. Nothing highfalutin. Don't be too fancy. Pray from your heart through Mary's heart. And she will ensure that you will hear the voice of her son. Amen. Amen. I ask Jesus and Mary... How do we forgive? I mean, I forgive too, and I'm not sure mine's that perfect either, my forgiveness. Lord, how do we do it? He began to speak to me, and he gave me one step, and the next day another step, then the third day another step, and finally he gave me four steps. He taught me, this is how you forgive completely. I hope that you have the handout. Did you get a handout on the way in? And do we have, a, somebody have an extra one you could hand me so I could take a peek at it? Thank you. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm sorry you couldn't hear me. I have a big mouth. That's almost a miracle you couldn't hear me. Well, sure, is it okay to preach from here? It's hard because you see, I love, I'm from an Italian family. I'm used to hugging people and kissing people. So it's hard to be way back here. I feel kind of lonely. 
but if it's okay with you, we'll do we'll make it work. Is that okay? Hallelujah. These are the four steps the beautiful Lord taught me. They're printed on your handout. And before I get to that, would you turn around the other side of your handout? It says the litany of the dust. I don't know where I found this. If I see a good prayer, I snatch it up and hide it, you know? I found this somewhere, and the Holy Spirit guided me to bring it to you tonight. I haven't used it in a long time. It's a beautiful litany. This is a litany that's from the heart, you see? Sometimes we pray litanies in a really high level. You know, super, super high. But they don't touch the heart. This one's kind of real. Amen. The litany of the dust. If you were made out of dust, would you raise your right hand? We all qualify. Isn't it amazing? Made out of dust, destined for eternity. Amen. By the blood of Christ, made out of dust, destined for eternity. Now this litany, this, this will get us ready to forgive. It's really a litany of humility. Beloved, I'm going to say the first half. Would you answer, Father, forgive them. Okay? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. For those who have betrayed us. For those who have let us down. For those who have been indifferent to us. For those who have crippled our lives. For those who have doubted us. For those who have accused us. For those who have preferred others to us. For family members who have hurt us. For friends who have denied us. For those who have walked away from us. Now we're going to switch the response now. If you would answer to the rest of these. Father, forgive me. For my own self-pity. For my lukewarmness. For my times of despair and mistrust. For my refusals to be hugged. For my disbelief in your love. For my searchings everywhere but in your heart. For apologies frozen on my lips. For my words of love unspoken. For my kisses and embraces ungiven. For compliments never offered. For a heart closed in self-centeredness. For my own unforgiving postures. For not believing in your forgiveness. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And the effect of grace. Now and at the hour of our death. Amen. That's a beautiful litany, isn't it? Isn't that fabulous? Keep it and pray it again. Without humility, there is no grace. Amen? Now, beloved, on the other side are the four steps of forgiveness, complete forgiveness, that the Lord taught me. And the first step should be obvious, but we still need to say it. The first step is we have to forgive the one who betrayed us or offended us with an act of the will. In other words, forgiveness is a decision. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. I may hate my mother-in-law, but I forgive her. It's a decision. We call that in theology an elicited act of the will. My will, the most important part of my soul, is what decides. It's groundbreaking. 
It's powerful. It's prophetic. So we began by making a decision. No matter how I feel, I'm going to forgive the one who raped my sister. It's a true story. I will forgive the man who raped my sister. I have to ignore my feelings and my detestation and forgive this person with a decision. And so the example that I printed there, you see in bold print on number one, I forgive you, brother, in the name of Jesus Christ, now and forever, period. No matter how I feel, I must forgive. If I forgive, I will be forgiven. And so I must forgive. So the first thing to do is ignore all your feelings. Ignore them completely. And out of obedience to the good Jesus, forgive with a decision. Any questions on that, brothers and sisters? We say in Spanish, preguntas, preguntas. Any questions? Now that's a powerful step, isn't it? It's the first step. It's powerful though, isn't it? That no matter, maybe someone committed adultery on you. Maybe someone abandoned you. The Lord says, first of all, forget how you feel and just obey. Daddy, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you now and forever. Amen. Can you make that decision? That's a spirit-filled decision. I think somebody has a question. The excellent question is, can I say this prayer for someone who's already died? You better believe it because their soul lives forever. Amen. And sometimes beloved, the soul of the one who hurt me is waiting in purgatory until I forgive them. And when I forgive the one who wounded me, that is a blessing so powerful they can release a soul from purgatory the same day. Amen. Of course it can. Forgiveness is love. It's a powerful prayer. And so now, beloved, are you strong enough to say this prayer with me? This first line? Can you try to say it? Don't worry about how you feel. You can do it. My father's cousin was murdered in the park in Tampa with his fiance. Can I forgive that man? Yes, I can. Not on my own. I can forgive the man who murdered my father's cousin and his fiance. I can through the Holy Spirit. It all begins with a decision. We're going to decide now. So would you now take 30 seconds? Would you please everyone think of someone you need to forgive? Perhaps the one who most troubles you. Maybe you haven't thought of it in 25 years. Think a moment, who do you need to forgive the most? Now we're going to say the prayer for that person. You don't have to say the name out loud. When we get to the place where it says name, we're just going to pause together, okay? You say it quietly to Jesus and Mary. You don't need to say it out loud. If you want to, it's okay, but you don't have to. We're going to say the first prayer together. Everyone, everyone together. I forgive you. Pause. Okay. In the name of Jesus Christ, now and forever. Now let's say it one more time to make it more real. Try to do it now with a decision. You're actually deciding regardless of your feelings. Everyone together. I forgive you, blank, in the name of Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Congratulations. You just did your first step of real forgiveness. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Catholics come to me in confession and say, Father, I forgave, but it doesn't feel too good. 
and they never got to the second step of forgiveness. It's not enough to forgive my neighbor. Now I have to bless him. This is what God taught me. He said, he told me in the Bible, return a blessing for a curse. Amen. The man who abused my sister put a curse on her and my family. The Lord says, don't curse him back, bless him back. Amen. We are to return a blessing for a curse. And a big blessing, not a tiny blessing. A big blessing, the Lord says. If you read there in number two, it says, return a blessing for a curse. It should be a rich, bounteous blessing. Press down, shake it together, and overflowing. That's right from sacred scripture. Pray for the person who offended you. Now, how do you pray for them? The Lord said, pray for their joy. That's how you know you're putting a blessing on them. Because here is what most of us do. Is this on now, Tony? Can you hear me, everyone? Here's what I learned. I've done the same thing. Like, my, let's say my uncle perhaps offended me. And here's the way that we bless. We say, Lord, bless my uncle. Uh, I forgive him and, and I ask you to bless him. But you know that limp he has in his right leg? Would you let him keep that limp forever? That's how we sinners bless. Lord, please, uh, I forgive my grandmother, but you know that, that terrible rash she has on her face? Could she keep it for the rest of her life? We want to bless like a half a blessing, you know what I mean? But Jesus, he didn't hold anything back. When he blessed me from the cross, every drop of blood poured out from my sins. Every drop. He did not hold back one drop. He wanted me to be completely forgiven and blessed. Amen. And so the Lord says to tell us when we go to forgive someone completely, yes, the first step is a decision. I forgive you no matter what in the name of Jesus. The second step is a blessing, but not a partial blessing, not a half blessing. I bless you, uncle. I bless you. Press down, shake it together and overflowing. And I said, Jesus, how do you know you've done that? He told me, he really got me. He said to me, pray that he has joy. Oh, that really gets me there, you see, because I want to forgive him. I want to bless him, but I don't want him happy. You see what I mean? Because I'm a liar. You see, I'm a hypocrite. It's not real. If I forgive you and I bless you, I want you happy. If I don't want you happy, I'm a liar. Stop it right now. You're a liar. My dad was a judge, I know. If you... If you wish joy for your neighbor, then you've done something cool, something real. Amen. And so the Lord gave me a trick too. It's kind of hard. So, well, Lord, what about this one? I don't know how to pray for him to have joy. He told me, imagine your relative smiling like a saint. Imagine him in your mind smiling with the radiant joy of a saint or an angel in heaven. If you can imagine that for your mother-in-law and then will it for your mother-in-law, you have begun to bless her truly. Amen? Hallelujah. So that's the second step of forgiveness is blessing the one who hurt you, even if it was something terrible like rape or murder, even that. The Lord said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them. And he didn't say, Father, forgive them, but send them to hell forever. You see, that's what we do. Or, Father, forgive them, but send them to purgatory for seven billion years. No. The Lord says, this day you'll be with me in paradise, you murderer. This day you'll be with me in paradise in perfect joy forever. Mamma mia. This Jesus, the man said it right. There's a new book out that says, God is greater than that. He's greater than what you and I think. He's greater than that. 
And so the Lord, I said, Lord, that's beautiful. I'll try to do it. Is that all? And then the Lord really pulled the rug out from under me because he told me no. He said, when you forgive them and you bless them with joy and you ask God to, for, to give them anything they want to have joy. If my uncle who beat me up wants a gold Cadillac, ask God to send him a gold Cadillac. Wish anything he wants. If he wants a mansion like Donald Trump, get him a beautiful mansion. Whatever he needs, if he needs a, maybe his wife died and he's lonely, pray God gives him a beautiful wife to bring him back joy. Amen? But listen, then the Lord told me this. He said, this is how you really know. What, Lord? He said, wish for your enemy when he dies to go straight to heaven, to have a place in heaven for all eternity higher than your own. Oh, I'm not going to do that. No, no. Yes. Yes. Wish for the one who hurt you to not only have joy, to have perfect joy, everlasting joy, to go to heaven and have a place higher than you and I forever. Assuming we get to heaven, you and I. Either way, it works. Amen? Do you see where I'm getting at? What the Holy Spirit's getting at. Now, some, some don't like this. I see somebody getting mad at me right now, getting mad at me. I, I'm sorry. We have a fake Catholicism, a false Christianity. If we continue to hate our neighbors and our enemies, we despise them, we forgive them, we want them to go to hell. That's not Catholicism, that's Satanism. Amen. That's what Satan desires, not you, not me. If I love my neighbor, I want him to be well. Amen. I'll tell you a true story from high school. I'll try not to say any names so they don't catch this on the internet. When I was a teenager, you know how teenagers have little groups like cliques? You belong to your little group and like every teenage boy, I wanted to be a cool guy. And I had my group, there were like four of us, cool guys. And there was a new guy in school, in my high school. It was a big high school, a couple thousand kids. And there was a new guy, and he was uh, from another country. So he was a foreigner, and um, he looked kind of goofy. He didn't quite dress perfectly like we knew how to dress, you see. He, dre he dressed differently, and he wore his hair different. And uh, he was uh, kind of a, a nerd, I guess you would call him. And uh, this nerd, he was a, a straight-A student, and... For some reason, he would sit next to me in every class. I, I want to be cool. I want to be cool. And the biggest nerd sits next to me in every class. And uh, I had a, well, I mean, I was an honor student and he was too. So he was a very intelligent boy. So I, I, I should have thought it out. I and mean, he wanted to be with other young people who were, you know, like intelligent, could talk a, an intelligent conversation. So I sort of understood that part of it. But that didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be Mr. Cool and be with my buds, you know. And every class, he'd sit next to me. And I thought, oh, God, they're going to see him talking to me. And I didn't know what to do. And I would try to stop him, like turn my shoulder and study my paper or something. And so I went to Mass one Sunday at my parish in Tampa, Florida. And the priest was preaching. And I don't know what he said, but when it hit me and when I got home, to my mother and father's house, I prayed, I knelt down in my bedroom, and I repented. And I was just a teenager, but I, God, I've hurt my friend. Why did I do that? Who am I to treat this other kid that way? I call myself a Catholic. I never miss Mass. I go to confession. I pray the rosary and I hate my neighbor. And Lord, forgive me, I told him. Forgive me, Lord. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. Amen. I was wrong. I said, God, forgive me. I'm going to befriend him tomorrow at school. The next day I went to class and he turned to talk to me and I talked back. I smiled. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. And, 
in the next class, the same thing. And I said, hey, you anybody to sit with for lunch? He said, no, hey, well, come sit with us, I told him. So he sat with us, the, you know, the, kind of the biggest nerd. And I told my friends, be nice to him. No, be mean to him. I told them, be nice to him. I don't know why I was doing it, but I just, the gospel got me. The Lord is the hound of heaven. He pursued me down the hallways of my school and got me. And so I began being nice to him. And, and one day after a couple of months of being nice to him, he turns to me and he says to me, Jim, can I go with you to church? I was surprised. He says, I've, I've never been to a Catholic church before. I said, well, aren't you baptized? I thought everyone was baptized. I was so naive, you know what I mean? I thought everybody was baptized. He said, no, I've never been baptized. I said, well, sure, you can come with me to church. So he started coming with me to church every Sunday. And after mass, he would ask me these intelligent questions about Virgin Mary and the Eucharist and the Assumption. And these are beautiful questions. And one day, after Mass, we'd sit in the parking lot for an hour or two. He looked at me and said to me one day, Jim, two 17-year-old boys, he says, Jim, yeah, you should be a priest. He blew my mind. And then he asked me a week or two later, Jim, can I be baptized? I said, sure. He says, Jim, can your mom and dad be my godparents? And he was baptized Catholic. My mom and dad, thanks mom and dad, became his godparents. He became a Catholic doctor. He got married, had four children, and was the greatest pro-life doctor in his area. Catholic pro-life doctor. How did that happen? How did that happen? God taught one little sinner to forgive his neighbor and to seek forgiveness. I just reached out to him in humility. And I loved him. I didn't, I didn't half love him. I told my buddies, you be friends to him too. Don't be mean to him. I invited him to my house and sat with him at lunch and brought him to mass. When you forgive someone, do it all the way. Amen. And now there's another holy, faithful, Catholic pro-life doctor in the world because of that. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I'm, I'm not patting myself on the back. I was a big, fat sinner. Jesus taught me something, you see. I just obeyed him. We have to obey the Lord, amen? And so we forgive our neighbor, then we bless them, but not a half blessing, a total blessing of joy in this life and the next, and not just in the next life, but higher than you in heaven. Then you have blessed your neighbor. What? Yes. Even the one who killed my cousin, yes. Even him. I wish for him eternal joy, amen? Can you imagine if we all did that? The world would change in one night, amen? And so we forgive and then we bless. Now that may be enough for tonight, I don't know. This is getting, this could get very heavy because there's two more steps. If you want to forgive like a saint, a total forgiveness, even more than this, to forgive with the decision and then to bless with perfect heavenly joy. What more could there be? Is there anything more? Should I go on or should I wait that for next time? So I touch on it for a moment? Okay. The third step, this is the saintly step. I have to thank the one who hurt me. Oh, maybe not face to face in the spirit, but in prayer, I thank the one who hurt me. And I thank God for allowing this wound because all things happen according to divine providence, you see? And so if someone has hurt me, God has angels around me 24 seven, a lot of them. And the devil sends arrows my way 
all the time. And the angels put out their wings and they block every arrow. And now and then God says, hold back your wing. And the angel holds back his wing and an arrow comes right in and gets me. Poof. Do you think the angel made a mistake? You think he was unable to stop that arrow? Every now and then, an arrow comes through because it's aimed so perfectly by my enemy that when it hits me, it hits the cancer of my arrogance and my pride. The sin inside of me, this particular wound from this guy here is so perfectly aimed that when it hits me, it blows my pride to smithereens. When God allows a wound to come in, He's crushing my pride, my arrogant pride. You see, we secretly think that we are God. I'm sorry, we do. We act like we're God. We never ask him for any help. We do it all ourselves. We secretly believe that we are God. So does Lucifer, by the way. Lucifer wants to be God. And when God allows an arrow to come through, he crushes my pride to pieces. So I can finally start becoming humble, like Mary. Amen? It's true. And so we begin to thank, we begin to thank the person who hurt us in the spirit. And we thank the Lord for the wound. And so Father Young probably knows this story. But he's a Franciscan. When one of the brothers asked, St. Francis, Father Francis, what is perfect joy? Do you remember that story? What is perfect joy? And St. Francis said to the brother, he said, oh, brother, perfect joy is this. He said, perfect joy is taking off on a pilgrimage with all of your brother monks through the woods. On a long pilgrimage all through the night in the middle of winter. When it's freezing cold and the snow is at least three feet high and your feet are bare and you're walking all night long in the freezing night in the snow with bare feet to finally to get to the hermitage on the other side and finally when the sun's beginning to rise you see it and there's a light shining in the window and you run the last 500 yards and you race finally to the hermitage and you bang on the door and you say, brothers, I'm home. Brothers, I'm home. And the candles lit in the window because they've been waiting for you. And brother Porter, the door brother, opens the door and he looks at you and he says, you again. And he grabs your habit and he throws you into the snow. He slams the door shut in your face and he says, good riddance. That, Francis said, is perfect joy. Are you ready? Let's take off our shoes and go right now. We're going to walk to New Jersey together. How could that be perfect joy? How could that be perfect joy? Someone tell me. Do you know why? How could that be perfect joy? That's the words of a canonized saint. Indeed, some say the greatest saint who ever lived next to Mary and Joseph. How could that be perfect joy? Any thoughts? Any ideas? Okay, you're on the right track. What is your name? Donna, one of these. <laughs> Donna, very good. You know what Donna said? She said, because then you have no one else left but Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! When everyone rejects you, then you're just getting started. Then you begin to be a real Christian. Because then all you have is God. Amen? I'll tell you another true story, much shorter. I can't say any names because it has to do with the monastery. I used to be a monk and I was in a monastery and the monastery, I don't know how to say any of this. I got to be very, very, very careful, but the monastery, let's put it this way. It was not the, it was not a home of saints. Let me put it that way. 
It was not a home. It wasn't the most blessed monastery in the world. And someone said something one day in the monastery, one of the older monks. And it wasn't good. He said something that wasn't good. Um, I won't go into the details tonight, but I objected to that. I was just a novice, but and he was really disrespecting Pope John Paul. And I said in front of all the monks, I couldn't take it. I'm a Catholic. I love the Pope. And I said to him, the Pope is the vicar of Christ. We have to obey him. He turned white, that old monk. How dare you? I couldn't stand it to disrespect Pope John Paul in a monastery. He's the vicar of Christ. We have to obey him. I was called into the abbot's office. And the abbot asked me to leave. I was only 19. I gave up everything to become a monk. I had nothing. I even gave my Mustang away. I had a Mustang Grande. I had the most beautiful blue Mustang you've ever seen in your life. A 69 Mustang Grande. That's a great car. And I gave it away. Everything was gone. And he says, you have to be gone by, like, in two hours. But my... My family was far, they were away, they weren't anywhere close, anyone to pick me up. And I had books, I had a lot of uh, theology books, a lot of them, I, I didn't know how to pack them up in two hours. They told me to leave and I knew I was there because God called me there. In fact, the abbot had had a miracle the day I came that showed him, he said, this is a miracle. He's the one that told me I had a miracle. We did have one and now he's throwing it all out the window. He said, you'd be gone. I said, Lord, what do I do? Only 19, and this was my joy. It's like a young man marrying his bride. He's the most beautiful girl in the world, and you fall in love with her, and the wedding day comes. The little stars over your head, you're so happy. It's like that with a religious vocation. It really is. Except God is your spouse. I'm telling you the truth. The truth. And so... It's like, they were kicking me out. And I didn't know what to do. And I said, God, I can't pack this up in two hours. And who will get me? And I have no money. And the Lord told me, he said to me, just go. So I closed my door. I left the key. I left all my earthly belongings there. And I walked down the highway in the middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in nowhere, I'm just walking from my house. And of course, doing that, you always have to have that holy weapon in your hand, the rosary. Praying rosary after rosary. I didn't know what to do, I just walked. Lord, I know you love me and I love you. So here goes, we walked and walked. And then a car honked and stopped. It was a young friend of mine. He said, hey, Brother Jim, what are you doing? I said, I couldn't tell him. Well, I'm taking a walk. <laughs> he says, you want to ride? I said, sure. Where are you going? Well, my grandma's house. I had, grand I had grandparents who lived down the road not too far. And so... He took me to my grandparents' house. They were beautiful. So I went there to see my grandparents. And I walked in, they said, Jimmy, what are you doing here? They knew I was in the monastery. So I had to sit down and tell my grandparents what happened. It was so embarrassing. You know, the friend who picked me up was the greatest lover of St. Francis I've ever met in my life. He was a third order Franciscan. And God sent a Franciscan, a son of Francis, to pick me up. But you know what? That was probably the most liberating moment of my life. Walking down that highway with no one and nothing but Jesus. Who does God send but another young fellow who is in love with St. Francis? And he picked me up and rescued me. Years later, I came back to that same monastery by accident. 
and they asked me to preach to the monks. And they keep asking me back now. You see what God does? But what I had to do, I had to forgive this person completely, forgive them and bless them because they made a boo-boo. But what they did, you see, that set me free. And so we thank them because because of that wound, all I have left is Jesus. Amen. The, the song says, only drowning men can see him. Jesus was a sailor when he walked upon the water. And he said, all men are sailors. And only drowning ones can see him. Amen. And so, when the angel allows a wound to get through, thank the Lord, because he's setting you free to love and need God alone. Amen. And beloved, the last step is to praise the Lord. That's the last step of forgiveness. And the reason the Lord said to put it in is this. Sometimes you and I have enough grace to forgive our friend and to bless them forever and even to thank them but we still secretly harbor a hatred towards God. Oh, I forgive my mother-in-law and I bless her and I thank her. But God, why did you let it happen? And we actually secretly hate God for what happened. Isn't it true? The Lord said the last of forgiveness is to praise Him. He allowed it because He loved you. He risked our hatred to save our soul. Amen. It reminds me of the time when I was babysitting my nephew, Jojo. And Joe's big now, but he's a little boy. And I was babysitting Jojo and Jessica in their mother's house, my sister's house. And they were running up and down the hallway like this. And they were fast as lightning. And they're getting faster and faster. And so then I realized, wait a minute, we got to stop this. It's a small hallway. And they're going to fall and hit their head and get hurt bad. And so I said, Jojo, Jessica, stop. No more running in the house. When mom comes home, we'll run outside, okay? Boy, Jojo got mad at me. Little tiny guy got real mad at me. And he said to me, Uncle Jimmy, I hate you. With fury. And I looked at him and I said to him, Well, Jojo, I love you. And that's what God has done to me. You see, I say to God, I hate you. You let that arrow in that crushed my pride and I hate you. And he looks at me and says, well, I love you. He risked my hatred to save my soul. Do you see what I'm saying? He allowed me to be hurt. He knew I would hate him. I'm a bugger. I'm evil. He knew I would hate him. It would crush my pride and one day get me down so low that I reached out to him and he reached out my hand and he grabbed me and I fell in love with him and I was saved forever because I was crushed to the ground. You see? And so the last thing is that you praise the Lord with the flame of love. I praise you. I adore you for what you have done. You risked my hatred because you loved me and you will love me forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Any questions, brothers and sisters, on that?